today we have our guests uh, David and C. Uh, David is a serial entrepreneur. He co founded UP at 22, which Insight Partners acquired in 2010. He founded the first e commerce platform built for touch, which he called to Magneto. Okay, yeah. His struggle with mental health and addiction led him to homelessness. The overdose of a friend led David to seek help and check himself into treatment. There, he got a vision for data driven care and in recovery was born. The operating system helping modernize the addiction care industry, increasing access to care, and helping democratize reintegration to give people a real chance to thrive after crisis. And about SIG, SIG, is, SIG has uh, developed the MongoDB Orange County user group, and he is one of the old uh, <laughs> very old. I'm pretty very old. <laughs> working in MongoDB, and he has been a great asset to the David Street. As advisor, as, yes, advisor. as an advisor. And without further ado, I welcome both of you. Awesome. All right. All right. Is, is, is there a microphone or just uh... okay? Awesome. So thanks a bunch, guys. And uh, I mean, you, you, you deserve a better. Yeah, let me. He's uh, one of the executive architects at, at MongoDB. I think you were like one of the very early employees, right? Yeah. He still has SIG at MongoDB, <laughs> which is just amazing. I just have to renew it. I have to fight for it, by the way. <laughs> but anyway, uh, why don't you pick it up? Yeah, yeah. So I, I want to introduce, which you're okay. So uh, for the last four years, um, actually, David and I met here at USC yes. in 2018. We have a slide coming up. Uh, I mean, there was a data fest in 2018 for like NoSQL databases, and we did like a particular scan. And David uh, was invited as one of the founders. So his startup which is MongoDB, and I've been working with him for the last four years, and it's been a true honor working with him. You know, he's he's a, a true man. You know, his story uh, is quite captivating, as as you'll learn uh, shortly. Uh, but he's not here just to tell you about his startup and his journey. He's also here to hopefully inspire you to. When I'm assuming you're a student, when you graduate and you find something that you're not comfortable with in your daily life, that you feel empowered to disrupt and change them. Because just because they are, doesn't mean that they have to be that good. Okay, and I've been working with him for the last four years. Again, it's become a friendship, just as an advisor partnership. Without ado, you come today. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, so, if you want to maybe make the next slide, thank yeah. you again, guys. And like, like Sig said, you know, really, this is not so much a tech talk. I will get into tech stuff, but really, the, the end goal or my end goal is just if you guys are inspired and we're actually going to interact with you a lot we don't do like typical just q and a's um you can come off as well at the end if you have an idea um but we're going to give you a playbook of how to actually change an industry so like six said myself uh if you want to go to the next one to six um we we're going to go through a, a three-step process which really is identifying critical problems then creating a change that we can follow you on but then never forgetting to keep it human, to be very, very human centric, making sure that you don't forget why you're doing this. And that's the most critical part. The previous speaker actually touched on that. Let's go to the next one. Sorry, we don't have a clicker. And yeah, so I know. maybe we'll come in here and, and introduce us. But this was actually where we met. We met at USC a couple of years ago, like he said. Um, we had a, another David there, Dave Mugia, who's an awesome, amazing user of DB. He was, he was talking about, about their architecture and the things. Like, we blow up shards all the time. I was like, oh my God. I literally was mind blown. Um, let's do the next one, please. Um, and anyway, maybe stay there. Yeah. So, our background. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting confused here with, with like Zoom and everything that's going on here. So, it's like, doesn't even go well, away. Let's now. go back to. Um, yeah, yeah. There we go. Perfect. All right. Awesome. Um, anyways, again, my background, I founded my first company very early. I actually found that I had a college. So, it's a bad example for you guys. But um, I started coding at eight. I was bullied a lot in school. So, I stuck to computers there and my ass. So <laughs> I kind of worked out better. Um, so, my first company at 25, I think. And that's now a billion dollar company. They've, they've really grown tremendously over the last 12 years. Um, and I found it in recovery really from my own experience in the treatment. I ended up going deep into addiction. Um, a lot of my mental health issues that I hadn't dealt with in my whole life uncovered really towards, towards my late 20s. And as a result, in rehab, in rehab, I really found my real purpose. And I found that I could use my skill set, my business and technical skills that's actually not good. Um, and say, you know, if you want to maybe kick it yeah, off. Um, yeah. 
Um, just to introduce myself again. So, yeah, former MongoDB champion. I was a customer. I got in MongoDB in early in the days, like 2012. I was part of the very first MongoDB University cohort. And uh, and I really fell in love with it and was able to produce and build a hybrid cloud platform back in 2012, 2013. Even back when MongoDB was very limited in terms of functionality. And I said, you know, this technology is going to stay, but not just because of the technology, but because of the company that's behind it. And a few years later, I had the opportunity to join the company, and that's what I've been doing since then, working with a myriad of customers across the West Coast, Latin America, worldwide, on really, really interesting use cases. And, I, and I'm also you know, uh, advisor to startups, stuff like that. Okay. Awesome. So, so I think, you know, what we'll do is we'll just like click through these. Right. Um, I'll just go ahead and click. So finding your purpose, first of all. So, right, I just gave you guys a background on why I started this company. Let's go next one. So while I was in treatment, I, I was actually doing a lot of the previous speaker was saying, which is like, it was this kind of doing a lot of research. So I was there to for treatment for myself, but I also was very, very curious of what was going on, how these people were conducting treatment. Um, unfortunately, I, or maybe fortunately, I didn't go into a, a luxury resort for treatment with the CIs and all that much of that. I didn't want to leave patient like So I went to a really, you know, very basic treatment center out in Huntington Beach. And, it was owned by people that were kind of fraudulent. So they were taking advantage of a lot of the uh, coverage that, that, was, that was happening back then with, with insurance paying for treatment. The treatment is very, very expensive, as you see in a couple of slides. So they were basically just like milking money out of the system. However, the clinicians were extremely invested in it. They really care about us tremendously and they really were looking to, to help us, but they had no tools. This is one of the examples of the source that they had. So that's the actual EMR they were using. It looks like Windows 95 software. I don't even think you guys know Windows 95. <laughs> not that old. But you know what, what that causes in the industry, especially in, in healthcare, is uh, it creates this doctor with the back facing to you, or, 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 or a nurse that's it's not really engaged with it, sort of trying to navigate this really complicated software. And so while I was there, I started with actually real uh, sketches from the back of my worksheet. I, I couldn't have my laptop with me during treatment, so I started building the company of Shell Paper. Um, those two little notebooks are the actual uh, first, really, I guess, plan of the whole thing. Uh, but really, the vision for the and recovery was that I really found that it was too complicated for mm -hmm. to, to really execute their job, simple tasks. And beyond that, I also noticed as a patient that we were not as engaged because in the beginning, it was all of it's all about you, but then a new batch of people come in. And any back to you. And by the time that you're about a month in, you're really kind of left to the sidelines. So it's really up to you as an individual to stay engaged in your treatment process. So that could change very easily with technology. So let's go next. And finally, being human focused. So this is actually the end result. We were just kind of fast tracking a couple of years later. This is the, the replacement of the EMR. Uh, we're a layer on top of the EMR. We were able to mix different data sources, not just the EMR data. EMR is basically what a hospital uses or a clinic uses to manage all patient data. But we are able to be a layer on top of that, where we can take legacy systems, data warehouses, everything, and just merge into a single view and create very, very simple workflows for doctors and nurses so they can actually do their job much, much easier. And as we were developing this, really what was very cool is that we I actually physically went to the treatment center that we were um, our first client that, that we launched with uh, to sit with them, to work with the clinicians for a couple of days. I was, I think, for like four days, um, just watching them look. And I saw their workload and it was really crazy. They were literally like, there was one data warehouse, there were one data, data service uh, uh, um, software they were using. It took about 14 clicks for them to just open a patient profile to send out with one click a four question survey. And that was just mind blowing. They could have just had a direct link to it, right? And, but even beyond that, like just like reverse engineering the whole process, we created a very simple experience for them that I actually like to work in. And, and we have, Crazy MPS scores, like we have like a 9.6 I think for, for clinicians and like a uh, 9.8 for, for, for the patient. And that's unheard of in, in the healthcare industry. But it's because we took a product human first approach to building it. And that then leads me to this. So healthcare is broken. It's very, very broken in the United States. Um, if we go to the next one here. So this is a real quote <laughs> from MongoDB's- um, I'm a customer. One of, one of their customers, yeah, U UConn Health Systems, the big, big health system in, in Connecticut. And they literally fax between floors. <laughs> they fax. So if you guys don't know what a fax is, back in the day, your parents used to like send emails this way. <laughs> and so they use these machines still in healthcare. It's just mind blowing, really. 
and, and it's, it's it's not a, a surprise because it really in, it, at the core it hasn't been addressed. You know, we we're starting to now find or, or or see modernization of healthcare, but it takes a lot of time to really bring something that's inherently broken and rotting in the in the roots to be better, right? So why don't you bring this one in? Actually, this is really you. This one, um, I think, you know, what we're realizing, and, and this, this is like a common use case that, that we see uh, at MongoDB with not just healthcare, but banking, financial, even gaming, right? Like video gaming, is that everything has to really center around your customer. This case, patient centric. If you think about gaming, it could be the game profile centric, it could be the, the, the financial customer in banking, right? And like how everything results around it and the challenge that it creates by having data in so many different systems. And not being able to then get a holistic view of that person and what matters to them, right? And, and what can you recommend or what, what can you insight, gather insight from them? Because it is so spread out. And so it's not just that healthcare is broken, it's also that data itself has been broken because of the myriad of systems out there. Right. right. And so we, we talk about like identifying a critical problems. So why mental health, right? Why addiction? And this is something that might shock you guys, but it's a very important slide. Um, why don't we open that up? So brace yourselves. So yes. this is this is real data from the US uh, of overdose related deaths. Why don't we move our little um, screen here just so you can actually see it. Um, here we go, put it over here. Okay. So this is the largest spike in overdose related deaths was in 2021. That down there, you can see 1980s, it was okay. Then the opioid crisis started around 2010, 2015, started spiking and now it's exponential. We had 107, 600 deaths in 2001 from overdose related stuff. So that's, that's really messed up. And, and it can be so easily avoided, right? And if you go to the next one, uh, so, so, and this is how it can be avoided. You know, one in four Americans have a mental health issue and there's so much stigma around it. Like if you literally look to your right to your left, one in four of you have probably suffered from anxiety, depression, from bipolar, PTSD or more. If you're brave enough, who suffered from any of these? Come on, we all, okay, there we go. See like half the room. And it's, it's, and it's okay, that's the thing. It really is okay. You know, and I, I started this company and I went to treatment because I lost my friend, a big investor, great guy who's a really, really amazing tech innovator who really transformed the whole digital marketing space. And he died from an overdose for no reason. No reason. He could have just said, I need help. But it was not built into us to ask for help, right? And, and it's, it sucks. So next. And again, 24 million, uh, 42 million Americans. Yeah, oh, that's great. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Um, so 20, 42 million Americans suffer from addiction, which is really messed up. Do you, any of you know anyone else suffer from addiction? There we go. <laughs> Entirely. So, you know, we all know some. And the other problem, or the real big problem, is that treatment is really a privilege. It's not a right in this country. It costs $30,000 per month to go to treatment. 30 grand per month. That's almost a salary in some places. That's crazy. That's insane. Crazy. A month. That's yeah, insane. That's a really very big price. And and the problem is that if you're not rich or if you don't have health insurance, hopefully you still have health insurance in your job, but if you've been fired and you no longer have health insurance, you're pretty screwed. You might end up in jail, you might end up just dead. And that's your treatment, right? So so how do we change that? You know, and, and and really then when you actually, let's say you are lucky enough to get a treatment, you come into the growth system where only, let's say, uh, one in 10 of people get treated if they have a problem. They come into a broken health system. You can think about it like a funnel. And then 60% of people relapse after the first year, after they leave. So that means that they go back to using drugs after they leave the first year. And it's not a surprise that when I left, they gave me a handbook and it was from the best. Like, all right, good luck. And that's it. Thankfully, I had a resource. I can actually like come back to my life and fix things. When I was getting discharged, there was a kid that was homeless, going back to Ohio to be homeless. This kid from Palm Springs, who, who his parents had already set up everything for him, got a job, got everything set up. Big disparities. And, and I was like, God, this kid has no chance. Literally, like he's gonna go right back to the same environment and you're hoping that he's gonna be okay. It, it's, it's, it sucks, right? It doesn't work. So the vision for change was in recovery. So my company uh, really was built around that idea of how do we address these core fundamental problems so that we can actually make a, a, an actual difference. And the first one is really personalization. So everyone in treatment, Unfortunately, it has the same treatment process. You, myself, and her. Everyone has the same treatment process. It's very difficult to personalize. As you work in data projects in, 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 in your career, you'll understand this much more. But 
even personalized marketing campaign is difficult. Imagine personalizing healthcare, truly personalizing. It's very hard. And even though a lot of treatment centers and hospitals say they do personalized care, it's almost impossible for them to do it without the right toolkits, right? So precision care for us is one of the biggest, biggest pillars. Second is connected long-term. So this addresses the issue of when you leave treatment, what happens next? So we create a turnkey aftercare solution where you're still connected, you still have access, you still have resources so that you're not alone. And that's the biggest thing really for myself, uh, I just keep bringing it back to my story, but having my peers that were also in, in, in sobriety or, or, or in recovery, let's say, was the biggest, biggest help because I had to actually understood me. I could literally go to them and say, I feel like shit today. I feel like using, it was not easy for me. It was a very difficult transition. And, and it was great to be able to have that where I can actually just open up and say something. Um, and the last thing is these new transitions of care. So transitions of care mean when you move, let's say, let's say you go from one hospital, you go to another clinic, you go to this other hospital, whatever. Um, in this use case for us, it's, it's really, if you do relapse, if you come back, that you have a simple way to come back so that you're not penalized for relapse. It's part of the process. People mess up. It's okay. But having a simple way for your for your patient records to actually travel with you so you don't have to start from scratch is a very, very big thing that we do. So we the patient knows their data. So your your health record travels with you no matter where you go. And that's a very, very key thing for you. So that let's say that unfortunately let's say six months in I go back to using, but I go to a different hospital or a different clinic, I can unlock my records to them and say, here's what I've been through so that they can actually help me a little bit better versus try to start from scratch and do all the guesswork that's involved in the first two weeks of treatment, right? And that's really, you know, when, when you think about access to care, going back to that $30 a month number, rethinking everything. You know, with this infrastructure that we've created, we now can think about it from a different perspective. You know, you take a 6,000 foot view now and say, okay, let's let's address it before it's a problem, right? And, and this is where we're heading as, as a long-term uh, goal for the company is to prevent addiction to begin with, right? So all of these different factors that come into your life, mental health, whatever it may be, can be addressed early on so that you don't end up in the streets like I did. You know, I was homeless at one point with a needle in my arm in Brooklyn. It was unnecessary. Um, so rethinking the whole process from preventative care. So how do we start off at the retail pharmacy level? Let's say at CVS Health, and this is really cool. We actually had the idea of this like almost like five years ago, four years ago, and now CVS actually has uh, mental health professionals working there. So it's almost like going in that direction, which is really cool. Um, and that would help reduce the stigma, right? Because if people have seen while they're going to CBS that there's mental health services and they could just keep getting bombarded with the marketing of it, like you do with products, then it starts becoming normal. It's like, you know what? I do have depression. I do have anxiety. Let me talk. That's just such a great, great transition that we're having in the US. And I'm really, really glad it's happening. And lastly, social reintegration. So how do you actually give someone a real second chance? Give you a quick story. So I go a lot to these 12 set groups that I go to Narcotics Anonymous, which is similar to AA, which is Alcoholics Anonymous, basically support groups. And it's actually really cool to have them so you can come there and you can actually just be honest, which is super rare, right, in these days. Um, you can't do that on Instagram or Facebook. But so social reintegration, so having a real second chance. I see people that are sober, clean for 25 years, 30 years, but they fucked up in the past, sorry for mine. They, they messed up in the past. They maybe have a criminal record or they, or they, they, they messed up their financial, uh, you know, their financials while they were in addiction and they just cannot get a normal job. They can't get an apartment. They can't get much less a mortgage. And so what we're doing is we're taking all this data that we have on the publication and creating a recovery score that can be a supplement to the FICO system. So like actually you take this to an employer and say, Listen, I've been in recovery, not just my company, but like in recovery for five years. And I've been to treatment, I've done therapy, I go to support groups, I get I, I have I participate a lot in the community, and they can actually show this in a real way. So they can actually have a second chance and, and take it to an employer, let's say to uh, to, a, to a school for, for admissions or maybe to uh to uh, to a bank for a loan. So that's where we're heading. It's really making it possible to come back to life, making it cheap, making it five hundred dollars a month, not thirty thousand dollars a crime. And really, again, going back to the engagement first, right? So I'll stop right there. And one of the things I'm going to do towards the end of this talk is I'm going to ask you guys if you've ever had any inspiration to do something, right? If you want to start a company, if you want to change something, if you want to disrupt an industry, if you've seen something, start thinking about it. So we're going to call in you guys, and you guys can come up and, 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 and share your idea. Um, now, going back to the engagement first, right? So the way that we're transforming everything is by thinking about it from a journey. Um, 
you hear the journey maps a lot in product development, but you don't hear it in healthcare. So we've taken that approach into the healthcare space. We actually involved yeah. our clinics and hospitals that we work with in design thinking exercises. They they're shocked when we participate. They're like, "Oh, I have a voice in this." I'm like, "Yes, of course you do. You know, this is the software you're going to use. The process you're going to you're going to deploy to your to your to your clients. Of course you have a voice." As a doctor, as a nurse, as a clinician, you should be involved in the process, decision making process of, of the work that you're going to have, of the care you're going to deliver, right? So we created this in in, in conjunction, not, not just by ourselves in a little, little room in our startup, but working with hospitals and doctors to really understand the patients and what they're going through, as well as patients. So quick journey here, um, and I'll wrap up with this. This is Rachel, who's a student, she's 26, uh, maybe she had a sport injury. Um, and she was overprescribed prescribed opioids. It happens all the time. If you you probably have seen uh, what's it called, dope sick or something that they, they've really gotten. That it's a great book, by the way. Read the book. Um, and the clinician here is a 54 year old Susan. She's got a Cuban hat. And so the way that we're doing things, the way that we're envisioning things, is that there's a pre treatment during. So if Susan, let's say she's low risk, she still has her home. She's still like she's not on the streets, right? So she has a little bit of a gap where we can condition her or help her get ready to go to treatment. So when you go to treatment, you're typically very depressed. Like when I crashed on it in treatment, I was not in a good mind space. I just really, you know, I, I wanted to be the right thing. It was really, really uncomfortable to have your rights taken away from you suddenly to just have to like surrender for once and then just kind of get help. So what we want to do differently is actually help increase that readiness change. So we connect them via a telehealth consult with their clinician. They have, they start building rapport, but also they start uncovering what does this person actually like? So in this case, they realized that uh, Rachel really likes mindfulness, that she likes yoga. So they, she, she's put into a mindfulness track that she's going to do with peers that she's also going to go to treatment with to start building relationships. She's actually getting excited about going to treatment. She's going to meet people that she already knows. And by the time that she gets there, we have a really, really good data profile of this person. You can't really see it here, but we're also then able to suggest to the clinic, here's based on data, 95% success rates with these types of treatment processes for such individuals, you start creating phenotypes of people so that you can actually start helping the, the decision making process of how people will actually get treated. Uh, then, when you're in treatment, you come in excited. So, she comes into to treatment, you know, ready to, to do this. She's, she's not depressed. She's like really excited to meet her clinician that she's been over Zoom or maybe over a telehealth consult. And the treatment center gets an influx of data of, let's say, this person has high self esteem. Uh, or low self esteem right now, but she was an overachiever before. Um, and she, she, they can see like specific tracks, like let's say pain management track, because she is in pain from her accident, and maybe a heroin prevention track. And she hasn't gone off from just using the pills to actually going off in the street and using heroin, right? So um, as she's doing her process, just engage with, with the mobile app that, that they use during the, during, during the whole process of treatment. They check into activities. They also have a lot of activities in between. So you're not with to, left to your own devices, you know, in between uh, treatment sessions, because that's actually it's a critical time when you when you're alone by yourself and, and your thoughts start kind of spinning out of control. Um, and the whole time, the treatment center also has a lot of data insights that are coming out of this, so they're able to understand in that little plot there that someone maybe has dropped an engagement, and we can correlate that with maybe lack of sleep or maybe an argument that she had in her chats with her boyfriend. So, like, we can understand that hey, you are actually getting some insights as a doctor to really try to get a little deeper than, than just like, okay, what's up? How are you? And hopefully that person's honest, right? Versus, okay, you haven't slept very well. We noticed that there's like stressors in your, in your chat. They can't read the chats where you can extract, you know, and emotions and so on and then maybe key words out of it and say, you know what? Something's up with you. Let's talk. Before that person ends up really either dropping an engagement or fully dropping that treatment, which happens a lot. Um, we actually had someone leave treatment, um, or not leave treatment, but leave the treatment center or the hospital I went to, and score some heroin at night and came back and overdose. This kid, he was 22 years old. You know, he, was, he, was, he was actually excited to be in treatment. He would get his dog. He was really, really sweet kid. And he went off and scored some dope and just over, overdosed. And everyone knew from that from that little unit that he was in, apparently afterwards, the retrospective was that everyone knew he was looking to score. And no one said anything. So they, were, they don't want to be your bad. But if there had been a system, they could easily be detected. You know, that someone has left, someone has come back randomly at 2 a.m. And that's very, very simple to do with data. So the last piece, and I'll wrap it up here. So the aftercare journey. So what happens? How can we fix that 60% relapse rate, right? So 
when you leave treatment, your orange fuss are, are, are our platform. You've already used it to, to do your treatment process. And we then onboard into this flow, which is basically, uh, we call it in Recovery Connect, but it's a familiar app. You've already used the, the whole thing. And it kind of keeps you connected with the peers. And that's the key thing. We create an immediate safety net. We don't replace like 12 step groups of A and NA circles are wonderful. But we just give you a very, very relevant group to, to, to connect with, to do your, your recovery together. And we match you up by personality, by likes, by lifestyle, by what might actually be something that actually clicks, right? So, and we also include a, lead, a team leader who maybe has a little more recovery in their health. But it's very similar to you. So that you guys can actually mesh and go to this person for advice or for help. And the whole time you're dealing with your clinicians or your hospital, let's say, is still be able to keep track with you, be still in touch with you. One of the biggest factors of, of, of long-term recovery is continuity of, of, of contact with your caretaker. That's a very, very important thing. Even if it's a monthly touch point, it makes a massive difference. There's tons of academic studies that show that by having a simple touch point, even a phone call, people tend to uh, stick to, to their recovery. And it's, it's, it's wild, right? Mm -hmm. Lastly, um, last little piece that we haven't actually built that out yet. That's actually, that came from an internal hackathon that we, we do a lot of, when we onboard new people, new staff, we do hackathons because I just, I, I hate reading a freaking onboarding package to you. I think you're much smarter than, than that, right? So we just bring uh, all the team together. We do a hackathon. In this case, it was focused on on, after, um, on what happens after your treatment. And they came up with a solution called Boost, which is a life, a life platform, essentially like beyond treatment, beyond care, helping you then get a job, go back to school, whatever it may be, and partnering up with same with, with partners like for Uber rides to go to interviews and all that stuff. Anyway, I'll wrap it up there. Let's start with this. So sparking up your own ideas. So how can you disrupt an industry, right? So um, I'd like to leave that with you. Think about it. So just going to talk about Mongo really quick and, and, and the journey that we've had with them. By the way, they're our database provider. We are, we, we chose them because of the fact that we can we can use a, a, a NoSQL structure to actually bring in all these different data that has extremely different structures and be able to consume it and present it in a single view, which is really, really uh, game changing for us. And that's the reason why we're able to do this. But think about things that you might want to do to disrupt the industry. And we'll come back to you. All right. Thank you. Okay. So we'll try to go fast here. I, we do have another talk, I think at 2 p.m. or 2.20, I think it is, where we will go deeper into, in, it's, it's a full MongoDB talk, where we'll go of all the functionality in the 6.0 and Atlas release. So today, I'll, I'll keep it really light. Um, and actually, my talk is really about how can I help David, right? How can I help David build a vision? Um, and one of the core values, actually, MongoDB, as all employees, we're, we're sort of driven by these six core values, okay? Think big or far with this stuff. This is one of my favorites. Build together, embrace the power of differences, make it matter. And that's where, where you know, I'm really making it matter for David and for what he's trying to do. Uh, as I said, I said that for good. Be intellectually honest and on what you do, right? So make it matter is really about making sure that what we are doing, you know, is always has meaningful impact, not just to ourselves, to our customers, and that we're strategically on what we're doing and we're focusing on, and also not letting what we like to say, you know, perfection be the enemy of good, right? And so as an advisor today, but I ask myself, how can I um, set this um, core value, you know, in motion and help them, right? Um, over the years, I've, I've helped them introduce to other practitioners, other healthcare. Um, is that? That's okay. Yeah. Other, awesome. other healthcare practitioners, now they're using MongoDB, keep up in great ideas. Uh, now we're actually talking to other partners like GraphQL and Apollo. Right. So now we can build a super graph. Uh, so we can then, you know, spread out uh, all, all these graph build calls into, into data that he's building. Uh, obviously, be a sounding board to him, be neutral. If something, if we have a feature product that may not be the best to him, I'll tell him, that's not for you. Not, not right now, right? And that's super important for a startup. I mean, it, yeah. we tend to get yeah. pushed into different directions right. based on what salespeople want to do, and that's not the case. Or, exactly. sure. or sometimes, you know, I'm used to working with enterprise customers, and I always like to my solutions to be the ones that are putting in place, right? <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but with startups, you're right. Like you know, it's, it's try fast, fail fast, and 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 pivot and try we, again. Um, to be all, to be honest, we don't know what we're doing. Half the time. <laughs> we're just kind of improvise, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so you know, one of the things that I always keep in mind is, you know, how can we apply the platform thinking towards healthcare and what David's providing uh, and recovery, and what sort of features we have in, in the MongoDB. Um, technology ecosystem, right, that can help build the platform. For example, if we think about uh, legacy systems, right, 
MongoDB has a feature called JSON schema, which I, I like to call it tunable data governance, right? Oh, most of you probably know relational databases, rigid, rigid uh, schema, right? In MongoDB, it has to be flexible. And that helps a lot when you're building this special single view that might have a uh, variance depending on, you know, it's uh, the first time uh, that the person has enrolled, or maybe, maybe they, they brought history from a lot of other previous conditions, who knows, right? Uh, there's actually a lot of um, also standards in the health industry like HL7, uh, fire headers that are now governed and we can, and we can create JSON schema that will help the data comply with these, with these standards, right? Another one, if you think of systems of record, uh, Davis platform in recovery is going to have to uh, integrate with a lot of legacy systems. They're going to require transactions, for example, right? People say, hey, no SQL can have transactions. Well, that's not, really, that's not true anymore, right? The web, the moment we actually have transactions since 4.0, so that's like uh, three or four years ago, if I'm not mistaken, uh, right? So he's got everything he needs to either build, to both build a modern system as well as integrate with legacy systems. Um, one thing that is super top of mind for healthcare is security, right? Uh, and one of, the, one of the aspects to protect your data or the ways to protect your data is through encryption. Now you can always encrypt the data at the, at the server side, but that, that is still open to you know, a DBA, perhaps being disgruntled and going in and actually accessing your data, right? Or maybe data is actually stolen at the server by because it's hacked. So what if you can protect the data literally from when you read or when you write it from the client side? So we've released a feature called client-side field level encryption about a year and a half ago, or maybe two, we recently uh, took it to the next level and released queryable encryption. So what happens now is you can encrypt data from the driver, right, whether it's Python, Java, and whatever, have the driver, the application could actually reach out with your encryption key, encrypt the data, send it over, so that literally from, from what it leaves, everything will now be uh, encrypted full time, right? And where I really geek out, that's why I put this slide here, you can actually decide what encryption algorithm is used at the field level. So like in this case, I can't reach after how my glasses, but uh, policy number and SSN, which are green, are using the uh, deterministic algorithm and medical records and, and blood type are using the, what is that? Random algorithm, right? So if someone was actually crack you know, uh, or hack your uh, your picture, they can only get half of the data, right? You could literally put it at the field level, all right? Um, and if it's an even better one, notice that the medical record is an array, right? So that means anything I can I can add any document later on, sub documents actually, and they'll still be encrypted. So I don't have to worry about what's what's being added over there. So anyways, and now we're up on time. You can keep picking out. Our next session will be at 2 p.m. Well, I'll go in more in depth about all the issues in MongoDB. So what we wanted to talk about is what well, we have said earlier, but I'll, I'll do that for yeah. later, is how can we disrupt our industry, right? right? So MongoDB story is that the, our two founders, Elliot and Dwight Merriman, were actually trying to build like a no-code platform back in the, in the late uh, 2000s. And they couldn't do it because they were using Oracle. So they realized, hey, I need a database that is flexible so I can build like a no-code Know, uh, platform. And they actually started building MongoDB. And then they realized, hey, there's more value in this database than the platform we're trying to build. And they pivoted, right? Uh, and they literally changed the industry. They literally uh, transformed the industry. And now, David, you know, within recovery. Yeah, I mean, we did the same thing. So we, we if we just go back to the things of this one, it's really great because they, they, their human focus was mm -hmm. that the developers were just stuck. And I'm, I'm, a, you know, I'm talking to myself. So, and, you know, I understand this 100%. You know, Developers were stuck with old systems that were just almost impossible to work with. So MongoDB kind of followed that same model that we're showing you here. And for us, it was really that everyone was just changed the same thing, right? That was the biggest problem we identified. We created a vision for change by delivering as unique as unique as you want, as individual, right? And then creating being human focus, creating amazing experiences, both for a patient and for a clinician and for the family members also involved. Apply the science and the healthcare, go figure. It's it's like so, so such a rudimentary thing that should be happening, but it's not. Now, go back to you now. So your story. So have you, any of you have any ideas? Probably you have any of your students, right? So you're really engaged. So I'm going to pick on you. Unless someone has an idea, go for it. Yes. Yes. Okay, I have something. Let's come up. Come on, come up, come What's your name? Uh, I'm Alex. Hey, Alex. Alex. Hi. Hey, Alex. Here, come. Tell us to the camera view. Yeah. 
how would you put your idea into this frame? Right there. Anyway. <laughs> All right. So, um, unlike probably most of the audience here, I'm coming from a biology background nice. and using data applied to a biology background. And so, something I'm thinking a lot is kind of a three pronged approach to um, attacking problems in healthcare. So, nice. uh, one is personalized medicine. Okay. Um, AI, and then something called omics nice. technologies, if you're familiar. Of course. Um, so basically, there's a shift to new technologies and um, ways of processing data is kind of shifting abilities from, and testing and research from going after one target to hitting multiple targets all at once. Nice. So instead of studying one gene, you can look and see a person's entire genome. Mm -hmm. So I think the simplest way to explain this would be cancer. Um, so a little bit of background, cancer is kind of broadly defined as uncontrolled cell growth. So it's a cell or a group of cells that stop listening to everything around it and just grows uncontrolled. And there's a variety of factors that it needs to do that like getting nutrition, evading the immune system, and a whole bunch of other things. So it, with new technologies, you can look at not just, you can not only try to pick out specific things that are different about the cancer cells. So for example, you could look for specific genes. Um, you might've heard of BRCA1 or 2 in breast cancer. Instead of targeting specific individual genes, you can look at the entire genome at once. You can look at everything the cancer cell is producing. You can look at an individual's gut microbiome to see if they're, for example, if you're taking oral medications, how that would be processed differently from person to person. Take all of that data um, with a bunch of patients and use an AI to predict the most effective treatments on a patient by patient level. That's amazing. Yeah. That's well, good, my thought. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and it really falls into the pillars, right? Like the, the critical problem is that uh, it's, it's so generalized or, or so, so, uh, so, uh, what would you call it? Like isolated right now. If you can be more holistic, that's sufficient for change. You're being in the focus, you figure it out as you go. But mm -hmm. I, I love that, that it really falls into that. So thanks, man. Really yeah. appreciate that. Anyway, we're right. up there. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I think you know, don't be afraid. I'm a single person with a small team, and we are transforming an entire third and billion dollar industry. And I'm not a healthcare guy, I'm a tech guy, I'm an e commerce founder. But I was able to bring this and make it actually human and really, really come up with a solution that can really work. And so can you. So go, go this route. Thank you. Nice. Thank you.